Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a most productive morning with two workshops, and I hope you still have the energy to feedback, to discuss, and to be active, because I've heard you had very lively discussions, and I hope we get, we'll get some very nice feedback from the people here up on stage. I am Christina Opava, just like yesterday, and <laughs> As you might know by now, I'm the Vice President of ULAR, representing health professionals, and I have the privilege to lead this. Uh, oh, these shouldn't be here. Here. That's our first slide. So, we've had uh, four workshops, as you might well know, and we have four feedback um, people here. And I would like then to introduce the first, who is yesterday's moderator that I am now mocking. And uh, uh, it's John Church from Ireland, well known. And uh, you are going to feedback from the session on how to make RMDs sexy. And we look very much forward to it. Welcome. That was just, yeah, thank you, Raj. <laughs> so 50% of the audience attended two workshops. The other 50% are not sexy. <laughs> okay, it's a very serious uh, title we had to deal with, but we had a little bit of fun as well because it has to be an area. Um, so our workshop was about making RMDs sexy. What we really meant by that was how do we uh, engage the support of the general public for a very serious disease area. So, just to take you through some of the feedback we have. Ooh, that's not the, the first slide. Oh, okay, the, the slide myself and Diana put together is not there, unfortunately. Another little gremlin. What we started doing though is we, we decided after I presented all the, um, the work from Ireland, we basically got each table to, to write down what the common misperceptions are. And this is a, I mean, I think to all of us we realized that this is an extremely important area to get right. We took all the common misperceptions that were written down and we grouped them all in together. And really we were looking at three areas. Um, so the misperceptions, by far I think the greatest misperception, misperception amongst the public is that arthritis is only for older people. So it's only an older people's disease. Um, and that was very much agreed. Um, the whole invisibility side of it, that you cannot see the disease, so therefore if you don't, you cannot see the disease, you mustn't be ill, you mustn't have a disability, why would I support you? And then the other side of it was, the third bit was um, the disability side, which we also interpreted as ability and capability as well. So this area affects work, it affects your ability to, um, to perform normal day tasks, um, the perception that if you, you're only sitting around all day doing nothing, and then the knock-on is respect as well. So once we grouped all the feedback into three different areas, um, we then developed some, some, some statements. And in the theme, in the interest of being as provocative as, as possible, um, our first statement, which we would like you all to vote on, really focused on a, a, very, a very serious area, and that relates to the way to change perceptions of RMDs is to use imagery of children and young people. So that was a, a, a statement that we've developed and um, we'd all like you to vote. If you agree on that, you put your green card up. If you disagree, you put your red card up. If you're not too sure, you put your white card up. Okay. So by and large, most of the room agree 
that a way or the main way to change is to use um, imagery of children and young people. Um, is there anybody who put up each card? Would they like to explain why perhaps they, they voted that way? It is a way, it's not the way, but it's, it's what our group came up with. So Naila, would you like to? <laughs> Funny enough, Naila, it's... Um, Would you like to? Yeah. Um, why I um, write card up? Um, because sometimes you can you can misuse or, or is that a correct word? Mm -hmm. Misuse the image of children and young people, and mm, I think it's a delicate balance between using them for a cause and and. Yeah. I, I know it also in my country it's it's very easy to just put the children up, but I sometimes have a feeling that we misuse them. Yeah, and, and absolutely, that's a very, very valid point, very valid. I actually was surprised there was a lot of green in the audience. I thought there'd be more white and maybe the odd red or a bit too, because this is a very emotive area and it can be misinterpreted. And certainly in our country, the, the rheumatologists were not happy that we were doing this because they want to give the impression that you know we can cure. There's there's no more disability anymore amongst children because we have all this medication. But it is it is a, an interesting discussion and, and certainly went on and on in our workshops. So it's good to talk. The second one, which we may need to explain a little bit of this, but we we this was this was the overwhelming. Um, area that we all got stuck on and, and spent most of our debate. And really what we're saying is the word arthritis is no longer useful in raising public awareness about RMDs. So, fingers on the buzzers and your green, red and whites. Would you like to vote? Or do I need to explain that a bit more? What I mean by that? Yeah? Okay, there's a lot of green going up bits of red and bits of white. What, what we mean by this is, uh, just let me explain where we got to it. I mean, we all agreed that the perceptions were, ev everybody in the workshops agreed on, on everything bar, how do we present the disease arthritis to the public? The word arthritis uh, isn't always fully un understood amongst the general public. Um, those with diseases, say, of connective tissue areas, fibromyalgia, etc., may feel left out. Um, and arthritis doesn't fully explain the severity of the disease. Um, so I suppose what we were saying, particularly in, in, the, in the second workshop, was maybe we need to come up with a new term. Something along the, the lines that they have in the Netherlands, um, which, which they call RUMA. You know, a lot of the debate we talked about was the understanding of, of other diseases like cancer, and nobody really needs to fully explain what cancer is. Everybody understands the term, um, where that's not the case with arthritis. And if we need to go forward and break down perception barriers, we need to start thinking about, are we using the right terminology? Um, so that's, that's where we are with that one. Is, does, does that change your voting? Green? Okay, so by and large, you all agree we need to examine this word before we go to the public. And our final statement, everybody can do something and nobody can do everything. Apple pie is tasty and mothers are good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and we will now uh, switch to the next speaker, who is Judy Amelan, and you will report back on the Young Power workshop on facilitating transition in young people with RMDs from child to adult. Please. Thank you, Christina. Um, I uh, want
want to share a summary of the workshop. So we had this morning, I think we had two really interesting workshops where everybody worked hard. We started early and in the first work workshop, the eyes were a little bit closed, but they were getting bigger during the time we talked to each other about transition from uh, child to adult, to the age, but also from childcare to adult care. And we had a lot of discussion. Uh, Lucy, my colleague, shared her daily practice as a transition coordinator, and Simon shared his experiences with the Euler press recommendations on transition, and we worked on three of them in subgroups, and uh, we noticed that we all come from different places. There are differences in culture, and there are differences in healthcare systems, and we try to formulate dreams, and we try to meet each other in these dreams, and uh, we actually did. We share some of these dreams, and we can also make some practical steps by going to this meeting here at ULAR and talk about transition and share your experiences. So uh, we put our key findings in the statements, which I am uh, going to show you now. And uh, uh, Christina, you help me with it. Eh? Okay. Okay, this, this is the first statement. Adults yes. aware of transition phase, we should avoid the word trans the very word transition. The, the should word be transition. That's your suggestion. Yes. And what is your vote on that? It's a difficult one, I is see. Is it difficult? Yeah. Well, it looks like we have mostly green. We have a red one here. Do you want to speak up and um, explain your thinking process? Yeah, it's on its way. Uh, I think it's hard to avoid the word. And uh, the children and other adolescents uh, have to wear it's a transition, it's the reality. They have to face you, uh, the reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, anybody who voted green, do you have a suggestion on an alternative or does Judy have any mm -hmm. to feedback from the workshop? Anyone who wants to suggest another word for transition? Yeah. Um, uh, personally, I would say it's continuous. It's, there's from when they're first diagnosed to whenever. It should be a continuous stream of care and of treatments and mm -hmm. it shouldn't different. Transition implies differentiating between the two, <coughs> whereas it's, it should just be one continuous stream of care for the patient, for mm -hmm. the person. So that's basically why you don't like the word transition. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can share some thoughts uh, from our workshop why we made up this statement. We talked about transition and uh, we explained that there are different definitions of transition. You can talk about the transfer to, from child to adult care, but you can also see transition as a life stage, as a disease stage. So everybody has different thoughts about transition. And when we talked about activities focusing on transition, a lot of delegates uh, shared their experiences that when they uh, pronounce an, an activity where the name transition is on, young adults don't show up. So we talked about how we get this activity, how we trick them to come and think about yourself as go, come, becoming independent and talk about the subject, but not name it transition to trigger children and young adults to come to activities focusing on this subject. So that is why we put up this statement. Okay. Thank and I, sh I share the, the, the opinions uh, here in the group. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. quick question. Surely that's more an issue of timing of the conversation rather than the word transition. If you start having the conversation after someone's hit a certain age, once they've turned into adulthood, once they can start seeing the doctor alone, then of course the word transition may be off-putting. Yes. But if you have the conversation about transition in the years going up to the handover time, yes. then actually transition is a very relevant word. Yes, I agree. 
we talked about one of the recommendations of the ULAR where a specific age is mentioned as transition age. And we had a little bit of discussion about the different cultures. If you're from the southern of Europe, maybe that age is uh, a little bit uh, older to be independent, lose of your uh, uh, parents. And in the northern European countries, you see that children are more independent at the age of 12 and 13. So what's in a name and what's in an age? Is it more a process outcome? Must you talk about it early enough in the childcare and see it as a natural event when you develop to adulthood? So I agree with your, your shared opinion. We also, did a, we also formulate a second uh, statement that the main issue in transition is supporting parents more than young adults with RMDs. So what's your vote for that? Do parents need more support than the children in the transition phase? <laughs> oh, we have a red cluster here, we have a green here. So I think this is a mixed bag. Does anybody, anybody want to speak up in support of this statement? So those with green cards, anyone with a green card? What is your opinion about supporting parents rather than? It's me again. Um, <laughs> I'm in support of that statement because I think that part of the transition phase is actually parents explaining to young people what's going on. And actually, I think when parents, I'm talking about not the treatment, but the transition is mm -hmm. important. Um, so supporting parents in letting go of understanding that they have to let go of that, of the care position that they've been in and helping the young people take responsibility for it. And I don't think you can let a doctor be in charge of that process. Yes. I think a parent is the person who's best placed to have those conversations. So anyone voting against this statement? Who wants to? Do we have any red card holder here? Yeah, please. I think that except for like the parents, I think the young people are more important than the parents. Because <laughs> it's about them and not about the parents. If I look at my own situation, it didn't matter what my parents would say to me. It was like more that I wanted to like be in the face and not anything that my parents would say. Thank you. Well, you can interpret this statement in many ways, I think. I think, I think also. I interpreted it as you have to support parents in letting go, which <laughs> would be benefiting the young person as well. But there are other interpretations as well, I yes, realize that. I agree. So do you have yet another one? Yes, the last one. Statement three. Patients should be part of the multidisciplinary transition team as an equal to health professionals. Oh, that's uncontroversial. Uh, <laughs> Martin, <laughs> do you want to speak up as the only yeah. one? <laughs> <laughs> no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't be laughing. <laughs> no. <laughs> Is there a microphone for Martin? <laughs> well, I, I, I attended one of the other workshops that will be reported later on. Um, but there it was stated that every decision should be a shared decision. This says that they have to be, patients must be part of the multidisciplinary. So they don't have a choice. Yeah. Uh, the question is a little bit whether that's fair yeah. or whether they should be have something to say what's the right <coughs> moment to enter that multidisciplinary team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so not automatically. No, so your statement is actually to replace the must with uh, should be invited to be part yeah, of Yeah, should be given the opportunity yes to be part of the team. Yeah, good, point. good point. Thank you. So I think we need a re-vote. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make a re-vote. Everyone vote for Martin. Hold up your green cards. Martin, there is a lot of support for you. <laughs>
Okay, well, thank, thank you. you very much, Judy. Thank you. <laughs> so, our next reporter is Rika Alton, who is going to report on the workshop on improving communications between patients and their healthcare team. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, everybody, for Could you please take the microphone a little bit closer? Yeah, I was used to the other microphone, but um, so thank you very much for the participation this morning in two very lively workshops. Um, we covered a lot of topics, but also our subgroups worked nicely. So there are no slides at the moment. What happened? Can we please refix it? I didn't touch anything so far. <laughs> No. Communication is a two-sided process and um, actually we developed some statements for you but um, the discussion was so rich that the statements could not cover everything we really discussed. So what we decided in our groups is that we need more space for discussion of um, shared decision making. So statement number one we want to vote on is empowering patients and HCPs is a necessary process to practice shared decision making. The empowerment or empowering as a process. That statement was too Thank uncontroversial. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and the next statement is that came especially also from groups where are several nations in one group. It is um, on one hand meaning speaking the same language if you are from different ethnicities, but also in a broader sense uh, of understanding of speaking the same language. Patient and HCP have to learn, and the main importance here is to learn to speak the same language if the HCP, for instance, says, well, you have about 17 swollen joints and uh, your disease activity score today is such and such, 6.3, something like this. And the patient, there are a lot of patients who don't understand this language and they don't want to, to, to hear this. There are patients, of course, who are interested in this type of communication, but this is really very difficult. The both have to find out on a very individual level in the encounter, what is their common language, their common ground, how they can be on the same page. Otherwise, you are not partners, and here also this word is very important, on the same level, you know, because we have a word in German that says Augenhöhe. You can't translate it into English, unfortunately, that says that you always sit together with the patients on the same level and not the doctor is here and the patient is lying there in bed as we had it before, that you are always on the same level. But it's more literally that we say on the Augenhöhe, that means that you really have to learn to accept the patient as a whole person with everything that belongs to that understanding. So that means language on an equal level. Please, now you can vote. No, can I just ask yes, you before of voting? Because to me this is a little bit unclear. So do the doctors have to learn to speak the patient's language and the patients have to learn to speak the doctor's language? Or what is meant by learning to speak each other's? Actually, they have to find a mutual, ex in a mutual exchange to speak the same language. Okay. To, speak a lang to speak a language which is understood by the patients, but also the patients have to express, and we had a lot of discussion on taking notes before the visits, what the doctor is understanding. And what was also an important point in this context was that if a patient is too shy or has problems, that he should bring some relatives or some friends to the visit to help the patients to make this, what he wants to say, understandable. So, in so this no broader sense. <laughs> Are you ready to vote for this? Oh, again, very uncontroversial. Thank you. There so is no one to challenge on a red vote, vote here. 
Now another point which came especially from our German patient organization from the Rheuma Liga and this uh, was also discussed because it's very different in the different countries uh, the participants of the workshops were from. So patient organizations should encourage ACPs and this is a new approach and their organizations like national societies to practice shared decision making. This comes out of the need as we discussed before, that shared decision-making is on the agenda of EULAR, of Treat to Target initiative, of all great associations, but nowhere it is written how really physicians can practice it. So this is a new approach which was proposed also especially by the patient organization. So is this a task for the patient organizations? Please vote. I see one red vote. Two. Can we have a comment? Yeah? Can we have a comment from? Thank you. Well, actually, I agree with the st statement, but I feel that encouragement is not strong enough. I think it should be much more demanding. OK. Mandatory. Oh, there's another meaning. <laughs> um, and I think that um, th it's just wrong. I think HTTPs and their organizations should just know that actually shared decision making is the right way forward. It shouldn't be up to patient organizations to encourage them to know it. They should know it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I thank you very much for this statement. And I think it is really important that we continue this discourse on the importance and in the introduction of shared decision making and I just wanted to add that at the moment we are in a very um, active OMERACT working group on shared decision making to find out new how we can measure the influence of shared decision making on our daily work as well from the side of the patients as from the HCPs. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. And It goes the wrong way since I dropped it, or maybe I keep it upside down. Okay, so now we've come to the reporter from the last workshop, F. Adler, on uh, skills training, and that is more specifically uh, presentation skills that we are going to hear about. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> so no pressure to, from the presentation skills workshop. I have to make a very good presentation now, too, not to fail. <laughs> huh? Okay, so I had the privilege to facilitate two workshops. Uh, we actually had, this time the workshop was split into two. We had the more experienced workshop and the less experienced people workshop. Esme led the more experienced one and I led the less experienced one. So I would say that the more experienced workshop was actually at this level where they dealt more with the techniques of making presentations and the, present, uh, the workshop about less experienced people was uh, demonsterizing the word presentation because a lot of people who are not confident in making speeches or presentations they somehow see the uh, public speaking as a monster that will eat them so my aim was to uh, demystify and demonsterize uh, making presentations um, I'm very happy that EULAR is actually offering this kind of skills trainings because um, from my two workshops, I had the privilege of working together with amazing people who believe that they are not good enough and they are not confident enough. Uh, when they were doing their speeches, because we actually practiced making speeches, they have a lot to say. And this again proved to me that if the organizations want to become more powerful, you have to empower your members. Because um, don't think that the people who don't speak up have nothing to say. They are just holding themselves back. So give them skills and give them the confidence that they would speak up. And believe me, your organizations are full of very strong leaders who have a lot to say, but they just need a little bit of push and empowerment. And so I really hope at least the people who were at the workshops that they have much more courage to speak up and say what they have to say. Because from my experience, the patients, they know the real pain and they know what are the real problems.
but they sometimes want the experts to say it without with forgetting that they are the experts actually. So just um, allow your most silent members to speak more, so, so to empower them more. So, and now we have also two uh, statements from our workshop. The first one is... I don't know if I... Do I have to do it? Do it, or if it's ah, yes. on... Okay, first statement. There is one perfect way of making presentations that always work and suits everybody in giving a successful presentation. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Finally, I got the, you know, one with a red, yes. I believe, yes, that is, that is unfortunate. That is one style, actually, that works uh, for everybody, and it's your style. So it is actually, you were all wrong. So that because that is one way. <laughs> it's just individual style. Okay, and the second statement is uh, John Church. <laughs> so who do you choose? <laughs> John, Judy, Rika, Rep. <laughs> no, okay, we have lost the second, uh, the second statement. But I think the second statement was the most important part of making presentations is the presenter. Now we see a bit of a mix here. <laughs> Ep, do you want to challenge someone to? Can we have uh, one uh, green, one white, and one red comment? Oh, short comments then. S short comments, yes. So who, uh, a white, co uh, re uh, re uh, green comment first. Hello, I'm uh, Claudine. Um, I just want to say I followed your workshop, and you said everybody has a voice. And I think it's very important, so there is always a perfect way if you make it personal, if you can be yourself and you talk from the heart. And um, it opened a door for me. I'm not afraid to speak up anymore. So it's just an idea maybe for the conference that you could do this in the beginning of the conference to the whole people, so that people who are uh, not speaking up or who are too afraid to speak up just to empower them for 10 minutes. And that will, this would be a great launch for the conference, I think. Okay, thank you. A white comment. Bianca. I know the names of the people now. So. Well, thank you. You know, it has been a pleasure to be in this workshop. I think also a presentation is a whole, also should be a balance between contents, message, and the presenter. If the presenter is very good, but the message is nothing, also, well, yeah. perhaps it's yeah, a show, but not a, a presentation. And if the presenters cannot connect with the audience to transmit the message, mm -hmm. also, it felt something, also, I, Incline myself for a balance between message and presenters, not only one of these parts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the red one. Here's the Here, in front. Ah. I think it's uh, similar with uh, making food. If you have uh, really good uh, ingredients and a really bad chef, it doesn't mean that it's going to be good. And even the best chef in the world can't make good food out of really, really bad ingredients. And that's the same with the presentation. It's very similar to uh, what you said uh, from the white uh, paper perspective. If, it's, if there's no message, uh, then the perfect speaker cannot pull that off and vice versa. So no, there doesn't work that way, in my opinion. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Um, now, we, yeah. <laughs> now we've heard feedback from all the workshops, and unfortunately we don't have time to take a round with the whole panel, but I have a couple of very, very brief reflections. And from the first workshop, I take away that sex is something that has to do with age, 
So no sex for old people. <laughs> From the second, I'm a bit provocative, of course. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then for the second. <laughs> for the second workshop, I find it very interesting that uh, you really brought up that also the parents need support and that that will probably also benefit the young person if the parents are supported to let go in mm -hmm. uh, a pace that uh, fits the family's needs and the young person's, of course. And then from the third workshop, I think it was very interesting to hear that not only patients but also healthcare professionals need to be empowered in order to use shared <laughs> decision making. And I think that is very true. I very much agree on that. And then for Epp's presentation from your workshops, I still want to think that there is one perfect way of making presentations <laughs> that fits every size and every occasion. But Unfortunately, I think I have to agree with you. So thank you very much. And now I will leave it to Marius and Dieter for some final housekeeping. And I don't think I have to introduce you. They are our boys or your boys. So please welcome back on stage. We can, yeah. Yes, our annual conference is coming to an end. It was fantastic for us. We tried to put a few things together with the help of others. So we do not want to go into details of those different workshops. Um, but what were some key things here? I think what we saw is, and I hope this will work when you go home, um, that well, it, n knowledge and education are the key issues, and that we want to empower patients, certainly, but that we, as representatives, want to empower organizations, and then also, certainly, we will empower people with IMDs. We just heard what sex means and that, that it depends on age. But what we learned in different workshops, I think, what we saw is that our perceptions of IMDs have to be changed. That is, we must see, uh, we talked about terminology, for example, there are things that have to be changed. Uh, thing that we did differently yesterday, um, and it was fantastic for me, um, that best practice fair, and this best practice fair really showed what organizations do. And I must say, uh, it was a pity that there were only three winners, uh, because there were so many things that were fantastic. Perhaps the poster was not so brilliant that you thought, well, this is great, but the thing that was done was great. So it is a pity somehow, but I hope that all of you saw what other organizations do and that this may be also an idea for you, what you may use at home, what you may do at home and what you may do in your organization. Um, this is what, because this is what Simon did, and I would like Simon to tell a few words about that, so could you please give him a mic? Um, I think it's been a, a great chance for Young Pare to um, really get involved in shaping the conference and the start and I think from 2015 in Dublin we've grown as a presence but also to engage more people, more young people with RMDs so moving forward now into you know, the next 12 months and, and into the future we want more young people to 
keep playing a role in the conference and also in the wider work of EULA and um, we want to keep innovating, bringing new ideas and uh, really representing uh, the future people living with RMDs. Yes, thank you very much, Simon. Well, patient-centred care, this was our key topic and a lot of our sessions was around that. Um, but I think patient we want to encourage patients, patient organizations, and healthcare providers to implement patient-centered care. This is what, what we just heard before. Because we think, well, this is the only way of optimizing treatment, that there are better outcomes for patients, that patients feel better, and certainly this is what we have to make clear as well. This is a means of saving costs. We know that they're always interested in saving costs, uh, but so it means a lot for patients, but it also means a lot for those who have to pay it. And now Shnitana will explain a few words what they would like to have, that is the Bulgarian uh, patient organization. A mic, please. talked yesterday uh, in, in deep uh, now we should summarize that uh, we dream and we'll do our best to improve the interactions because we need we know that this is the most important thing to be together and uh, share our decisions and uh, um, improve the, the care for, for people with rheumatic diseases and we definitely should say that we will continue taking further actions with all our colleagues working in, in, uh, with, from the other patient organization uh, to work uh, in improving these communications and uh, to, to reach uh, the dream consensus at the end for better life for people with rheumatic diseases. And of course, uh, we would like to, to thank and to say that without the support from PARE, all our uh, aims won't be able to be achieved. So I would like to say really great thank you for PARE and ULAR, and we will uh, really try to, to keep uh, closer to all the recommendations and trying to, to raise them among our uh, decision makers, among our uh, rheumatologists and among our patients and uh, members. So, and really want to thank to every one of you who shared their experience because we see how amazing job you you've done. But you should be sure that you inspired and make us more confident that we can uh, try to do the same. So, thank you and thank you to all of you. Yeah. I'd like to thank you, or we would like to thank you. I felt there was a fantastic atmosphere, great commitment. Um, it was a great participation. And what astonished me, this morning I heard that some people even went to a bar late at night. Uh, and uh, they managed without money, without credit card, that worked, and the most surprising thing, they really worked this morning. They were participated, and that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dieter. You have summarized all the closing conclusions, the closing remarks in a very efficient way, so something to bring back at home. So I would like to share with you some more information and really all the good things end. And we are very sad that this fantastic conference has come to the end, but looking forward for the next one. So I would like to share with you about what a Thrice Day campaign. It's a very important to raise the public awareness globally. So I would like to call everybody to share this message. 
What do we like to do? You, your friends, and members of the organizations, just to share your stories in the social media. Just use the hashtag WaterThreadStory. And the selection of these stories will be featured in our video, who, which will be released at 12th of October. So please, participating, it's very important. We have spoke already in our conference about perception, about race awareness. This is the project that we should everybody participate in. And please encourage your members and friends. So, some more information about what we happen after now. So we have a lunch in the Seasons restaurants, and then the sightseeing, and then the gala dinner. I will give you some more information about that. So for those who like to join us for the optional sightseeing, of course, we go to the very famous uh, St. Alexander Nevsky, the church, the cathedral of Sofia, and also the sizing of the uh, uh, tour of the city, and the opportunity for sit uh, in a coffee shop and have a coffee. So, but please, you have to be in the lobby at 3.15. So the buses will leave promptly at 3.30, and we'll be back at 5.30. Two hours will be the tour. And for our gala dinner, we should be uh, in the lobby at, at 7.15. So the restaurant is not far away. But for those who have mobility problems, please check that and contact with our uh, secretariat, with the, with the help desk outside, indicate that, and then we ha we're going to arrange a transportation for you. For those who can walk, it's not far. I believe uh, Boriana uh, is not far. It's about 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So for me, maybe it's 20 minutes because I don't walk so fast. Okay. So please check your transfers outside. This is very important to see your transfers and please Reimburse your expenses now. We do not accept any reimbursements after the conference. So you have to uh, check that outside with our desk. So I believe that everybody has your workbook. Is that correct? Have you used the workbook? Yeah? You think that it's a useful to have this workbook and writing down your comments, your thoughts, uh, what you have learned? Can I see green cards or red or? So, is it, so, okay, fine. So this is something that we continue to use. Very good. So we have to share with you that organize this conference for EULA, it, it is an investment, a big investment, not just for money, but also for time. Time for the people who work for one year, almost, to organize this conference. The money that uh, Yula spent is an investment, because it's an investment, really. And what we liked from you is to share this knowledge, to share what you have learned here with your members back home. Please do that. Have a board meeting, or I don't know how you can do that at national level, but please share. You have your workbook, and you can uh, check what you have uh, indicated there, what you have wrote, and then share it with your members because we like the knowledge that we have uh, learned here to spread this to your members. Shortly after the conference, you're going to receive an evaluation form. Please fill the form because it's very important for us to learn from our mistakes and to improve for the future. So the, what, do you, what you write in, down in the evaluation form, we're going to use this in order to improve our next conference. Please, this is very important. And something that is mandatory for all the delegates. In six months, we are going to check with you if you have implementing what you have learned here. So be aware that in six months, you are going to have a new message in your email box from our secretariat asking you 
to report back to us what you have implementing in your country. And finally, I think it's very important because, as I said, this is something that many people organizing, many people is involved in organizing this conference. And, and believe me, it's not easy. Uh, I am the leader of the task force who organized this for the last, I don't know, five years. And really, everybody works very hard in order to deliver this two days program. So I would like to thank very much, first of all, and above all, the host country, the host organization, I see Sneshana, Boriana, Positar, and all the teams of the Bulgaria teams. Thank you so much for having us here. It was really fantastic. I remember that when they have applied for the conference, they have so stressed and say, can we, can we accomplish that? It's a big event. But you see, you can do that, and it was a very successful conference. So, and of course, as Dieter said, many thanks to you, to the delegates, because actually you did this conference a successful conference. You are active contribution, you are active participation. Thank you so much for you, for being here and for your participation. Thank you so much. <laughs> and also many thanks to many people who have been engaged in this workshop, in, in, the, in, the, in this conference, in their workshops, in the, in the panel discussions, in the, in the opening. So the speakers, the workshop facilitators, the workshop subgroup leaders. So thank you everybody for your input to our conference. Applause. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you also for the task force, because as I said, there is a task force working almost one year in order to organize the workshops and everything. So there is a big task force. I will, I will, it's about 10 people. I will not name that, but thank you so much, all the members of the task force. Also, I'd like to thank the people who have supported us in this uh, conference, the streaming company uh, team, the hotel team, the technicians, and the translators. Thank you all very much. <laughs> and finally, and of course not least, last but not least, I would like to thank very much the MCI is the Ladies outside that they support us logistically is, Mag uh, is uh, Madeleine and Regina. So thank you, Madeleine and Regina. <laughs> Maybe it's outside still. <laughs> and of course, I would like to thank the Rude Finn team. ESME is about 12 years or more? More. more. <laughs> so our ESME and of course, Brightene. Uh, Brightene. Thank you so much. They become our family after so many years. And uh, of course, our Twitter team, Florian and Magarena. Where is Magarena? So they ha we have so many tweets this year. Uh, I don't know, Florian, how can we give a number or thousands? At the moment, we're at 1,680. 72. Yoo -hoo. Bravo. <laughs> so, and finally, our stars. Our stars is Birte and Maria, who was the heart of the conference. Where's Birte and Maria? Sometimes I know that we have so many emails from Maria asking for things, asking for what are your flights, and she continue to send you emails about evaluations and re-evaluations, so you're going to have many emails from Maria. So, for tomorrow, so for those who are not departing in the morning and you have the time, you are very welcome uh, to join us in an informal networking. 
meeting. We're going to have this meeting from 9.30 to 12. So Dieter, I think you're going to lead this? Yeah. In the 9.30 to 12. Okay, so you're very welcome to join us and then we can discuss all the things that you think that is interested for you about EULA, about our projects, about PARE, anything that you think that is important. We can have these discussions as an informal way, of course, in our networking program, which is at 9.30. It's in the room Vichren, Vichren 1 and 2. Is that correct? Yeah. Vichren, yeah. the mountain. Yeah. yeah. So, and then there is also a lunch for those who are not departing in the morning and then they, the departure is on the afternoon, so they will be served lunch at the hotel. So, and because now we move to the next conference, before that I would like to say something that I have learned. Blagudarian Bulgaria. <laughs> and of course, Looking forward for our next conference, which will be in, in Lisbon. <laughs> what is that? Welcome to Portugal. So in Portugal will be our next conference from 24 to 26 of February, and we are looking forward to see you all there. So thank you so much. Have a good trip back home. <laughs>